Why we like anime fembo? Hell no. Till the no no no. Well, it's the episode where Moxie becomes a tom girl for whatever reason. Let's get into it. The episode, of course, starts off with a simple bait and switch moment where at the beginning you think that Blitzo is trying to break in and rescue Stolas, but in reality is actually trying to find Barb, Blitz's long lost sister. Now, enough with this foreplay, where's Barb? She checked out months ago. Overall, aside from just having a rather forced starting plotline, this duo plot point of Blitzo trying to find Barbie only really serves the purpose of our beloved writers once again forcefully attempting to give Millie and Moxie the forced allowance of another duo character spotlight and an opportunity for individuality which again you'd think after the writers forcefully tried this same exact forced plotline during its previous episode 4 of this show and mediocrely failing at it by not even remotely achieving the purpose of giving either Millie or Moxie further character development or individuality they would finally learn from this crucial mistake and take some of that overall criticism and newly learned notion to heart and therefore use it as a means to better the overall future scenes of this episode and character developments. Yeah, the overall introduction plotline of episode 5 is literally just the same thing as episode 4. It's just Blitzo once again being busy or forced to spend time on a different but more important task or project. Ah oh shit, Stolas, I can't today. Right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm literally on my way to take Luna in for her very important Helby's S-H-O-T. And it takes years to book an appointment at this place. Took five for me to get this one. Uh, pardon moi, sir. Not now, Mox. Sir. What please. part of no fucking time do you not understand? Just handle it yourself. Therefore, making Blitzo be forced to allow both Moxie and Millie to take the lead and have a position over a certain mission or killing job. Sir, let me and Moxie handle this one. You got it, sir. <laughs> We'll take the case, and I'll be handling this investigation. Blitz, put me in charge this time. Again, this is literally just the writers doing the same exact shit they already did in episode 4, with the only difference being that instead of Blitzo being busy taking Luna to the vet, it's instead changed to Blitzo being busy with finding Barbie Wire. Like, you guys are literally just doing the same shit that didn't work back in episode 4, and are expecting it to somehow work in episode 5, despite realizing that it did not work in episode 4 and you're somehow expecting it to work in this episode despite the notion that you guys have literally not changed a single theme with this overall beginning plotline like and you're expecting it to be somehow a different outcome other than it being a total bombshell you know there's a saying that Albert Einstein once said that perfectly describes this overall scene insanity is the act of trying the same thing over and over again expecting different results if this overall Overall, unchanged writing structure and uncreative world building isn't the definition of insanity that I don't know what is. That dumb scene aside, we then of course get into the introduction of Millie and Moxie going through with their plans of this mission within the human world, with of course the two of them finally picking up some disguises. Now aside from these costumes essentially just serving as just basic fan service material, these costumes literally serve no purpose other than to just be the essential joke of, hey look, look what happens when the characters are playing reverse personalities. The male character finally becomes the aforementioned straight man or butt of the joke, and the female character becomes the important spotlight, talk of the town, and notoriety to all. Vivzi, when people on Twitter complained about characters like Millie or other female protagonists not getting enough spotlight, notoriety, or attention within the show, they meant giving these characters some more important personalities of their own, not with them pretending to be some fake male persona that they're not like. That doesn't do anything or help solve the issue that only helps perpetuate the complaints that the audience was making because now you've shown that the only way you're ever able to make these female characters get any eyes on them is simply as a result of them being completely dependent on their male characters screw up failures or just flat out not even being men like the only reason why Millie even gets attention in this show is because you guys reverse the genders of these two characters just for a reoccurring cutaway joke why is there even a need to even reverse the genders of these characters anyway 
anyway. Like, there could have been a way more development with Millie if the things that Moxie had to go through with those girls had happened to Millie, because we would have then seen Millie stand up and be independent. Like, we didn't need another Moxie becomes the butt of the joke. We already had that in Season 1 Episode 5 with Stryker, and you guys did it way better there. Like, the show for as little in-depth of Millie's character has given to us, they've already established numerous times that Millie is this pseudo badass woman that helps save Moxie's ass and shines brightly when needed. Why not use this as an episode to opportunistically make Millie more two-dimensional by finally including or going over some of Millie's weaknesses or insecurities or things that actually get under this woman's skin? Like, the writers have had repeated attempts to do this from Harvest Moon when meeting Millie's family, from Hell of a Boss Season 2 Episode 3, X's and O's, with Millie and Chad's past relationship dilemma. Like, Episode 3 literally starts with Millie being rightfully upset over a past relationship with an ex. <laughs> Okay? Yeah. Just bumped into an egg. And even in that said episode, finally have a chance for the two of them to interact and have some high in-depth character development and conflict arc, but they don't do anything with it. What is up, party people? Chance? Wait! What? You know him? Uh, you remember that ex I was talking about? Did you date him too? It was a long time ago. They instead make it a Moxie story. They instead give the backstory to Moxie's relationship or history with Chaz. Uh, Moxie goes on about his past with Chad. Uh, no flashbacks contain any chemistry. It's just a bunch of, like, sex jokes. Moxie at the end of the explanation even does, like, the it's been 84 years meme, turning their backstory into a joke, which feels weird because he immediately follows up with, I want to forget that part of my life. So again, forcing in jokes when it's supposed to be serious. But they don't explain Millie's relationship or extensive history with Chaz. Also, um, Moxie's wife, uh, what's her, what's her name again? Millie, right. Uh, she also dated Chad, yeah? Uh, even though she's from the Wrath Ring and he's from the Greed Ring. Like, uh, can we get a flashback with them? Like, any explanation for how they met or... No? Got it. Millie's just Moxie's girl boss called to rescue. Like, you guys have had repeated attempts to diversify Millie's character or give them more than just a one-dimensional purpose, but you haven't done that. Like, what are you afraid of? Anyways, that being said, the scene then of course transitions to Millie and Moxie being in a dilemma about whether or not the two of them should go after a suspicious-looking guy, with the underlying joke being that the main character thinks that it's never the creepy guy, and that it must be someone else. Hey, Mox! Check out that shady-looking fella over there! I think that's our guy. <sighs> Millie, I hardly think pointing out the first guy you see is the proper way to conduct a rat traps. Really thought it was onto something. Nah, I know this is gonna sound crazy. What about the conductor? No, it's definitely not him. Oh, why not? Because he's weird and creepy. And you never suspect the creepy guy because it's too obvious. Whatever, man. I'm gonna go sit and look at the schedule. Only to then eventually come to the rightful notion that yes, it was the creepy guy all along. Sir! He's the target. He killed our client, and now our client wants to kill him back. You fucking what? He found out about your drugs. <gasps> no one was the murderer? The conductor's still on the train. Oh, yeah. He did it. Yeah, you did it. You solved it, Finn. I know. You knew he was a murderer all along. You. Thank you. We make a great team, pal. Again, this is literally one of the most clichéest, overplayed tropes I have ever seen in media out there. This is literally just Adventure Time mystery train episode level of plot substance, with each scene establishing a further alleged guilty conscience between various train members, only to then get more suspenseful scene by scene. Like, this is unbelievable. How in the world does a show like Adventure Time, a cartoon network show meant for children, elementary, and middle school, manage to handle the concept of a bait-and-switch theme in a more cohesive and actually plot suspense-driven way? Unbelievable. Anyways, that aside, we of course get into later scenes which of course show Millie's immense success, in direct contrast to of course Moxie's constant failure. Like, these scenes, while yes they do give Millie more first person point of view screen time, they literally serve no way to diversify the character. Like, how do these show's writers 
not realize that when you only show positive aspects of a certain character or certain person within a certain program, you end up making the character bland and oversimplified. This does nothing to help Millie look more diverse or more new as a character. We've already seen Millie be shown as a successful, powerful, and well-loved character already throughout this entire show. You guys are just repeating the same thing you guys have done, but just adding some special sauce on top. Having Millie be this 100% never wrong, never faulted character doesn't work. It's not relatable. Most viewers aren't going to relate to that because people in real life are not like that. Everyone, regardless of who they are, has immense amount of insecurities, struggles, or certain things that they're not afraid to discuss or talk about. And even in this episode, they do none of that with Millie. Like, Millie was already the pants within this relationship. And literally all these writers did was essentially just make Millie have pockets filled with more money. And even with this overall notion, all the writers did was just revert Millie to the same moxie mental status life support system that Millie's always been like in episode 5 and further on. Like literally one of the future scenes is literally just Millie conceding with Moxie's feelings and future desires within this episode. If you want, we can go off the guy right now. I think he's alone in the cabin. No, I have to do this right. I tell you what. Like, you can't say that you're gonna try and make this character more diversified, only to then just have the character revert to being a pushover wife, agreeing with almost every single one of the husband's notions. Anyways, one garbage song number and garbage meta humorish commentary later, we then of course jump to a scene of having Millie once again simply be Moxie's default comfort support and ego rescue. Moxie, you okay? Go away! Hey big guy, I know you can do this. You're the big assassin slash musician slash preteen girl I know. And investigator. And investigator. Look, I know it's been tough. Just keep playing to your strengths. You have all week to get it right. Okay, thank you. Like, I thought the overall purpose of this episode was to make Millie a more individual character. You guys literally just did what you repeated in episode 5, Harvest Festival. <sighs> Don't let him get to you. And hey, you don't need my parents to respect you. They will eventually. Mox, I think you've had enough for now. Let's head back to the house and get you clean. Moxie, I'm fine. I got worse than this during the flower toss at my brother's wedding. You just have to get out there and fuck up that brown nosing cocksucker for me. Use what you're good at. I love you, hun. But for fuck's sake. If you want to make Millie and Moxie more diversified characters, why not have Millie all in all realizing how unsupportive, unaware, and how much of a bad wife that they've been acting with the final scenes acknowledging how much Millie let the fame get inside her head. Like, it's literally that simple. Anyways, that aside, we of course get to our mandatory couple fighting scene, which like, amazing how it took us this long to get there, but oh well, better late than never. Which is what I would be saying if this entire fight wasn't stupid and only helped to tarnish Millie by completely ruining their points by brittling them with baseless hypocrisy. Save it, Mom! You could have finished that job anytime if you had just listened to me. Moxie, stop shaking! Just take a deep breath. I mean, if that's what the client wants. Well, it's just that I'm sure one of the other camp counselors killed me. I'm just not sure which one. I was out on the lake when my boat started to sink. Someone had drilled holes in it. Guilty and innocent aren't our business, Mops. Killing who we're paid to is our business. The counselors are the only ones with keys to the boathouse, and they're the only ones who knew I couldn't swim. Check out that shady looking fella over there. I think that's our guy. Uh, Millie, I hardly think pointing out the first guy you see is the proper way to conduct. What? What the fuck? And double standard tactics. And I had hoped that my husband would be there to support me half as much as I supported him this week. Stop the cap. <laughs> Again, no, this is far from the truth. You did like the bare minimum to support Moxie throughout half of the first song number. You literally forgot the dude even existed. The second point is also literally stupid. Like half of the time, Moxie wasn't able to kill this counselor because you made no attempt to help or support this man who is your husband, mind you. Which like, what? Like you can't refuse to show support towards someone that needs help and then get upset when they voice their upset with your lack of help. What? Anyways, that aside, all this scene really serves is to further perpetuate the notion of Moxie repenting for sins that do not exist, as well as an obligatory final killing scene. With, of course, Blitzo being there as well, because of course the writers at this point realize that without Blitzo, this plot is going nowhere. Anyways, forced Blitz 
Natsu and Moxie conflict aside, we then of course get introduced to Blitz's sister Barbie. Barbie! I know her. That's my sister. Now, Blitz's sister being in a human form already brings up a ton of questions and a bunch of plot holes for this overall episode and character arc. The first being that, well, if this character just got out of Hell's version of drug addict self rehab, then how in the world did this character manage to be able to get a human form so easily? Keep in mind, this type of magic is mostly reserved for grimoire book holders and high class powered demons, meaning that it would be almost impossible for Barbie, someone of that stature and also record, to be able to obtain not only a substantial that allows this woman to make human forms as well as create portals simultaneously as well. Like, what the hell? Like, did the earlier scenes within Hell of a Boss's episodes not establish how hard and difficult it is for imps of this class ranking to get such high-powered magic like this? Like, that's literally the reason why Blitzo and Solus are even together in the first place. Not only that, but the only other time we see these imps have better weapons or better equipment is assistance from upper hand demons, such as for instance, the only reason Striker has a weapon that can literally kill upper ranking demons as well as a magical rope that can stop Stolas from using magic is because Stryker got help from Stella in upper ranking Goetia. Like this overall scene between Blitzo and Barbie completely puts to question all of the world established building we've seen so far. Now obviously there are going to be some people that might say well maybe Barbie just learned how to do it on their own. Well secondly that poses another Another question, if it only took Barbie an effortless amount of time to easily create a human disguised version of their character, then that leaves the question of why even in this episode are Blitz and the gang unable to recreate human disguises for themselves? Like if Blitzo's literal drugged up sister is able to easily recreate a human form by just glossing over the grimoire or magical book, then why can't Blitz or Moxie do the same thing by essentially just glossing through the grimoire's pages and copying the spell needed to perform this said action. Well, I can blend in with humans easy enough. Just let me tag along. Wait, say that again. I can blend in? Do you have a human disguise? You three have been screwing around on Earth this whole fucking time without human disguises? Like, I get that the show establishes that Blitzo is a dumbass, but this level of stupid from Blitzo completely contradicts the past knowledge and attainable notions that the character had. How the fuck did you get caught by humans? Are you little creatures not being careful up here? You know, if you get in trouble, I get in trouble. We don't want that. We're gonna do this the old fashioned way. We're gonna need disguises. <laughs> No chance you can conjure us a couple of those, can ya? Anyways, that shitty plot contrivance aside, we of course dedicate the concluding scenes of this episode with some corny fight transition scenes with of course Moxie's possible ability to finally be proven worthy by finally killing the human target. With of course that said character development of Moxie being of course tarnished due to Millie's stupid main character plot convenience. The show tends to undercut Moxie's victories. I get He's a comic relief character a lot of the time, but my man finally has a moment to be a badass and show how much he's grown, only to be kicked in the fucking face for a drug- With the concluding scenes essentially just having Moxie for some reason giving Millie an apology- Looks like you did it. No, you did it. I'm so proud of you, Millie, and I'm sorry I let you down. Huh? This scene preserves no purpose, like the only reason Moxie was having a problem completing the mission was because Millie was getting off task and getting in the way of everything, so it's completely stupid that this show decides to shift blame on Moxie when the dude is just trying to take the whole scenario seriously, and Millie is the one dragging on the mission by completely losing track of what the original goal was. Like, being popular in the human world serves no meaning. Like, I suppose this would be a good way to establish character conflict between Millie and I suppose Verasica Mayday, therefore helping to give Verasica more character development, but even that notion is a bit of a massive stretch. That set aside, the scene of course finally closes off with Barbie leaving Blitzo and escaping. Uh, you're clean now. You don't fucking get it! Just cause I'm out of rehab doesn't mean I wanna see you! I never wanna see you! Ever! Next 
time you want to find me, Blitzo. Don't! Essentially just the whole cliche of, oh, I don't want to see you again, I've been avoiding you on purpose or whatnot. Essentially just the show's obvious way of establishing another conflict for the future episode, which, whatever, I guess that's fine. I mean, fair enough. I do enjoy that the show finally, like, did give Blitzo, who usually just has a I don't care narcissistic viewpoint. You gonna run off, leaving someone else to pay for the hotel room, steal their car and run, run three, three rings, rings to rap, rap and max my credit, credit cards on shitty, shitty horse, horse riding, riding lessons? lessons? God damn it, whore, you will not let that go. Choke on a sandpaper cock. Showing that, hey, for as much of a cold-hearted asshole that Blitzo can be, the guy does care about people and does have things that the guy truly cares about. Somehow, this is the most substance material from this entire episode, but that aside, we then get to arguably the worst scene throughout this entire episode. and local celebrity Millard Real Boy caught incesting tonight, showcasing a sickening display mm. on Looker's Dean. Too disturbing to look away, and we won't. Spindle horse, what the actual fuck is wrong with you guys? Are you serious? You guys actually included a incest joke in this show. For what? What purpose does this joke serve? Did you guys let Dan Harmon into the writing team of this show? Are you seriously borrowing themes from season 6 and 5 of Rick and Morty? Really? An actual incest joke? How actually untalented do you have to be where you have to make that a concluding scene? What the actual fuck is wrong with you guys? This joke literally serves no purpose other than to just creep out the hell of a boss viewers watching. Like, has hell of a boss really sunk that low to the point where the writers need to rely on this sort of disgusting humor. Thankfully though, this scene is luckily the concluding scene to the overall episode, with episode 5 closing it off with the imp gang being in the imp building, and the closing scenes zooming out to essentially make us aware that, oh right, Luna does indeed exist, which if anything is a massive letdown to how much Vivzy Pop's last posted episode, despite being in season 1, helped to diversify Luna as a character. It's literally been three episodes in a row, and they have not done anything with Luna as a character. Literally, Luna is just a mannequin at this point, not saying anything, lips closed, and is an all in all just an absolute waste of previous outstanding character arc and potential. That being said, thank goodness this episode is over. Let's go to my final thoughts. Game over! All in all, while this episode wasn't exactly necessarily a dumpster fire as season 2's previous pieces of work, to say that it would be a disappointment would be a massive understatement. This episode was nothing short of a, an embarrassing attempt, completely ruining any learning development of Millie. Essentially, all you guys did was make Millie a narcissistic, I'm right, you're wrong wife, who quite literally sounds like a crazed yandere from your favorite anime series. Although this time, it's not done in the fun way, it's done in a blatantly delusional and one-dimensionally uncreative way. You guys literally turned Millie into to a loud, wrong, and egocentric asshole of a character. Which, while if that's your goal, that's fine. But it completely destroyed every time when Millie would try and morally grandstand against Moxie as that would end up being destroyed. And all in all, this episode failed at doing what episode 8 season 1's overall goal was. Instead of making Millie a more diverse and comforting character like Luna, who helped both come to Blitzo's support and defense when the guy most needed it, I had a really shitty day. Oh yeah? Is that why you drank like five gallons worth of who knows what? Fuck, Fizz was right. I'm gonna die alone, aren't I? Just a wrinkly, old, weathered waste. Will you be there, Looney? I'll be there, Dad. Despite the overall fights the two of them have had, <laughs> my face for like five minutes because i adopted you and that should mean something well it shouldn't i didn't need you then asshole i don't now millie on the other hand was essentially turned into an unsupportive jock mean girl bully type character which like no that doesn't solve anything it doesn't help solve the fact that they're now one dimensional with a different trait and only of course further pisses off your overall viewers that were hyped to see a more responsible and tactful development to this character. So yeah, this episode was a 
bit of a mistake, which all in all is really unfortunate as I would have loved to see Millie have more traits or more personality or more things to their character rather than just them being a Freaky Friday polar opposite version of their previous self. But that being said, of course, I do want to remain a bit optimistic and maybe give the writers the future benefit of the doubt. So maybe in the future, I might be proven wrong and maybe the writers can, of course, give Millie a bit more of a consistent character arc and things to further add on to their overall character self. But with that being said, all in all, that's going to, of course, conclude this media criticism ramble. Feel free to comment down below which hell of a boss character or episode is your personal favorite within the comment section and if you like this media criticism rant and want to see more hell of a boss or other media take related content please feel free to drop me a like and a channel subscription down below and with that being said i'll see you guys later take care help i've escaped from kevin spacey's basement help me oh well that's sure we're ahead of their time that one didn't age quite so well are we sure it's not a family guy who's predicting the future here? Ew!